It's one of the most iconic sites in Australia, perhaps in the world. In the central desert, a vast sandstone monolith rises from an endless flat plain, its red walls changing color with the shifting sunlight. Taller than the Eiffel Tower, older than the Himalayas, and covering more area than the entire nation of Monaco, it goes by the ancient name of Uluru. Today, it is one of the most sacred places in the entire world. The traditional home of the Aboriginal and Nangu people, Uluru formed some 300 million years ago, at a time when even the dinosaurs were barely a celestial twinkle in God's eye. In the eons since, it has witnessed ice ages come and go, species rise and fall, and humans reach Australia. But there is more to Uluru than a simple tale of geology. As a central part of the Anagu's Tchkupa mythology, often inaccurately called the dream time in English, Uluru is a place of myths, magic, and modern-day controversy. Today at Geographics, we're putting on our sun hats, we're firing up the 4x4 and heading into the outback to explore one of Earth's greatest natural wonders. The Anangu creation story begins with a world that is empty, devoid of any forms or shapes. Interestingly, the geological story is pretty much the exact opposite. Uluru was formed not from nothing, but from many somethings, all crashing into one another. 500 million years ago, the continents as we know them had not yet formed. Instead, the Earth was a shifting mess of crustal blocks that kept thudding together to form new shapes. Were you to stand on one of these newly formed continents, you would encounter a world with no grass, no familiar animals, and landmarks such as Mount Everest wouldn't even yet exist. In short, it was a place as different to our modern eyes as an alien planet. But not for long. In the short space of geological time, a monolith would appear that all of us could recognize. As the continents formed, the impact created colossal mountain ranges. In what is now Australia, the Peterman Ranges first appeared, growing to the same height as the French Alps. But while the Alps are around today, the Peterman Ranges were destined to slowly erode away. And we mean slowly. While the process is going to take a maximum of 20 seconds in this video, in reality, it took tens of millions of years. Anyway, as the mountains eroded, the sediment ran off the edges. One of these sediment streams, made entirely of sand, began to pile up in a single location. It was from this unpromising pile of debris that Uluru would eventually form. But Uluru didn't just spring into existence. It would take two biblical-level catastrophes to create it. The first was a flood. At some point in its distant past, central Australia was swamped with water, becoming an inland sea. Over many more millions of years, mud and limestone all sank to the bottom of this sea, settling upon the pile of sand that was Uluru. As this muck settled, it began to press down. Eventually, it was pressing so hard that the Uluru sand pile fused into solid sandstone. The second catastrophe came 400 million years ago. At some point, the tectonic plates shifted so violently that the inland sea drained away and Uluru itself was flipped on its side. We're not going to lie, the sort of forces required to do that would have been absolutely crazy. But hey, since we're not recording this from Paleozoic Australia, we can just safely move on from that. After being catapulted onto its side, Uluru just sort of sat there in the Australian desert, waiting to assume its final form. Over the next 100 million years, the winds gradually eroded away the softer rock parts until just the durable sandstone remained. It was at this point, a jaw-dropping 300 million years ago, that Uluru was born. You know how sometimes you have a Sunday afternoon so boring it seems to last an entire year? Well, just try enduring 300 million of those afternoons in a row, and you might start to get the tiniest conception of just how long ago this happened. And so those endless Sunday afternoons pass by for Aluru. As the continents were born, dinosaurs came into existence. Then a meteor wiped out those very same dinosaurs. Aluru simply sat watch, waiting to be discovered. Finally, 50,000 years ago, which, by the way, is a length of time still so unimaginably vast that it's pointless trying to describe it, the first humans reached Australia. Eventually, a small tribe descended from that original group and ventured deep into the central desert. There they found a great stone monolith that changed color with the sun, rising out of the plain. They gave that monolith the name Uluru. So 
So that's the story of how Uluru came to be, or rather, it's one of the stories, because Uluru has two tales of creation, the geological one and the one belonging to the Anagu people whose ancestors first discovered Uluru in 47,000 BC. Now it's time we heard their version. But a quick heads up before we start, in Anagu culture, stories are seen as inheritance, things that get handed down from generation to generation. Some can only be told by certain households, some belong only to men or only to women, some can only be heard once you reach a certain age. As such, outsiders are only ever told the absolute basics of their stories, the sort of thing you'd tell a young child. So the tale we're about to tell you is merely a glimpse, and peak inside an ancient belief system. But that doesn't make it any less fascinating. According to the Anagu, Uluru didn't begin with crashing consonants. It started with nothing, with an empty world in which shapes and forms, animals and plants simply didn't exist. Into this unformed world came the ancestral beings. Emerging from the void, these beings took the forms of animals. As one, they swept across the landscape, creating and destroying, rearranging the nothing into something. It was from these twin acts that all shapes came into the world. The most monumental of all was Uluru. For the Anagu, Uluru is evidence that the ancestral beings they claim to be descended from actually existed. But not all of Uluru was created at once. There are other tales detailing each part of its creation, such as the tale of Lunkata. Lunkata was an ancestral being, one who took the form of a blue-tongued lizard. Long, long ago, he approached Uluru from the west, burning everything in his path. When he reached the rock, he took a cave near the top as his home, from where he hunted emu. It was this pastime that would be his downfall. The tale goes that one day, Lunkata saw an emu with a spear sticking out of its side, symbolizing that it already belonged to another hunter. But Lunkata, being something of a cosmic jerk, scuttled down and grabbed it away, dragging it off to his camp. Eventually, the original hunters came looking for their dinner. They asked Lunkata if it seen their bird, only for the lizard to hide the evidence and tell them no. But the hunters, they weren't stupid. As they left Lunkata's camp, they saw the tracks and realized what it had done. And they decided they would teach him a lesson. When Lunkata saw the hunters coming back, he grabbed his stolen food and tried to race for the top of Uluru. But race is a relative term here. Lunkata was so stuffed with emu that the hunters easily caught him. Then they lit a fire beneath him, and Lunkata burned to death. As he died, the lizard rolled down the sides of Uluru, leaving strips of his burned flesh clinging to the rock, strips that can still be seen to this day. It's a pretty cool story, and there are plenty of these in Anagu culture, each pertaining to a specific part of Uluru. But it's worth looking a little deeper at the meaning of the Lunkata story. According to the Anangu, Lunkata's fate shows both why you shouldn't be greedy, but also why you shouldn't climb a Luru. It's this aspect that's going to become important later. But first, we've got to tell one last origin story, the story of how ancient Uluru was transformed into Az Rock. Yes, it is time for the white man to arrive. In 1850, an unassuming young man named William Goss stepped onto a boat in England and struck out towards an unknowable new life. Just 80 years before, the famed explorer James Cook had claimed Eastern Australia for the British Crown, and now London was encouraging settlement on the new continent. This, as you might expect, was rather bad news for the Aboriginal peoples who wound up dying because of all the smallpox, measles, and flu that the colonists brought with them. But Goss wouldn't have been thinking about that as he boarded the ship. Still only eight years old, he would have thought of Australia simply as a place for the family to settle, a place warm enough to potentially cure his father's bronchitis. Little could the boy have guessed that he was destined to go down in Australian history. Not that this was immediately obvious upon the family's arrival. In Australia, Goss spent his formative years avoiding all of the snakes, spiders, and drop bears that plague the continent before finally landing a job at the Surveyor General's office age 19. Over the next few decades, he did such good work mapping hitherto unexplored parts of the continent that in 1872, the government invited him to find a route between Central Australia and Perth. This was the great age of Australian exploration, when you could make a name for yourself by taming, or trying to tame, the hostile continent. That very same year, another English emigre named Ernest Giles had traded in life as a post office clerk to start exploring and become the first non-Aboriginal person in history to lay eyes on Kata Tucha, an outcrop of Rocky Dome a mere 40 kilometers west of Uluru. 
With the insouciance only a colonial explorer could muster, Giles had promptly renamed Kata Chuta Mount Olga after the obscure Queen Olga of Württemberg. So, adventure was in the air in 1872. It's entirely possible Goss dreamed of being the next Ernest Giles, only presumably without that gross story about having to eat a baby wallaby raw to avoid starvation on one of his travels. Pretty yucky. Come July the 19th, 1873, Goss was on his travels when he spotted what appeared to be a tiny outcropping in the distant desert. As he rode closer, it grew and grew in size until the astonished Goss realized he was looking at a monster forged from sandstone. It was, of course, Uluru and Goss was the first European in history to witness it. Although Goss kept a diary, it's relatively dry, which makes it hard to imagine what he felt seeing this sacred monolith for the first time. Did he watch the rock begin to glow at sunset and think deep thoughts about our planet's beauty? Did he dwell on Uluru's mystical significance, the strange energy that it seems to give off? If so, well, he didn't write about it. The very next day, Goss climbed the monolith alongside his local guide. At the top, he was awarded with a vista of the desert all around him, vast and hostile. Goss declared that he would name Uluru Ayres Rock in honor of Chief Secretary of South Australia, Sir Henry Ayres. Then he clambered back down the rock and carried on his way. Not long after his discovery, Goss, who would be dead, fell by a heart attack aged only 38. But his place in history was assured. Goss had finally leaked the secret of Uluru to Australia's new settlers. For the next 100 or so years, the story of this monolith and its Anagu guardians was going to be very, very different. Let's leave the historical narrative there for a moment and take a breather to really get to know Uluru. We've already seen how the rock formed, both in the geological sense and within the Anagu mythological tradition. But what exactly is Uluru? What exactly was it that William Goss was so overawed by? The first aspect was probably its size. You can't really tell from photos, but Uluru is gigantic. Both the Eiffel Tower and the Chrysler Building in New York max out at heights lower than it. While that would have seriously impressed Goss, though, he would have no idea about the true extent of Uluru. Remember back in that time of geological upheaval when Uluru got flipped on its side? Well, only a part of it ever made it back to the surface again. Like an iceberg, Uluru exists mostly out of sight. The rock has been estimated to continue for six kilometers below the ground. As for the color, Uluru is well known for its reddish hue that looks most dramatic at sunrise and sunset shifting with the light. But that's not its original color. Uluru was gray, as parts around its base still are. According to ABC, it's only due to iron elements within the rock oxidizing away for so many endless millennia that Uluru looks so striking today. And it's not just the rock itself that is visually misleading. Take the surrounding area. What do you picture when you picture the area around Uluru? Even if you've been there, the answer might be, well, desert. Lots and lots of deserts. But there's semi-lifeless desert, like the Atacama, and then there's the desert around Uluru, which is actually teeming with life. There are over 400 plant species here, including some which are as freaky as anything Australia has ever come up with. Ever heard of the desert bloodwood? Well, it's a tree with sap so dark red that it literally looks like it's bleeding, like the Amityville horror has dressed up for Halloween. Not that the desert bloodwood is the only freaky thing around Uluru. This being Australia, there are reptiles with names like the Death Adder and the Thorny Devil. But perhaps the most famous story of dangerous wildlife around Uluru comes not from poisonous reptiles, but from an animal that, frankly, looks adorable at first glance, and that's the dingo. Yes, Uluru is the site of the Azaria Chamberlain murder case, probably most famous in popular culture for spawning the phrase, a dingo ate my baby. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Poor Azaria was just two months old when a wild dingo snatched her from her parents' tent and devoured her. But that was in a far future William Goss couldn't possibly have foreseen as he sat atop the monolith, a future with airplanes and penicillin and popular geography videos on YouTube. So let's instead turn back to what he may have seen. Well, if there had been some recent rains, Goss might have looked inside one of the rock pools that form on Uluru. In the waters, he might have found the Bratinella lancei shrimp, a super rare type of shrimp that's now thought to be extinct due to tourist activity. He might have also taken a look at the surrounding lands and seen the odd Rufus hair wallaby, another species that went extinct, although they began to be reintroduced in 2005. In fact, sat atop this 1.425 billion ton rock, Goss would have probably seen a world that hadn't changed for 10 of thousands of years. He would have been 
one of the very last ones. Now the word was out. Aluru's story was about to enter its dramatic next act. The story of Australia's relationship with its Aboriginal peoples in the 20th century is a story of mistakes made and lives shattered. And thanks to its symbolic importance in Anagu culture, it's also the story of Uluru. Millennia before William Goss was even wearing diapers, the Anagu had used Uluru and nearby Katachuta for their most sacred rituals. When the Australian government began creating indigenous reserves in 1918, this was initially taken into account. In 1920, Uluru was included inside the Southwestern Reserve and the Anagu mostly able to continue their traditional ways of life. Unfortunately, this arrangement it wouldn't last long. The 1930s would be marked by two growing pressures, local pastoralists or farmers and tourists. The latter started in 1931 when a guy called Walter Gills visited Uluru on camel, becoming likely the first tourist to the area. But it was the former, the pastoralists, who were initially the bigger problem. By the mid-1930s, farms were starting to spring up around the edges of the Anagu's reserve as Australia's once impenetrable interior was slowly tamed. As these guys set up shop, they started diverting resources such as water, bringing them into conflict with the Anagu. And when these conflicts happened, well, whose side do you think the Australian government took? By 1940, the government was pursuing an aggressive Europeanization project designed to take the Anangu and other tribes off their land and integrate them into civilization. This was the time of the infamous Stolen Generations, when federal and state agencies took mixed-race Aboriginal children from their families and put them into enforced adoption. At the same time, the first tracks had appeared linking Uluru to civilization. Bus stores were becoming a thing, and plenty of tour operators weren't happy that their newest destination nation was in a reserve. So the government did away with it. By 1940, the Southwestern Reserve was severely reduced in size, leaving the Anagu with very little. Eighteen years later, in 1958, Uluru and Katajuta were formally removed from the reserve. Uluru was renamed Ayers Rock National Park. And just like that, the Anagu were cut off from the place that had sustained their civilization for 50 millennia. Although the Anagu would continue to sneak into their national park to perform their ceremonies at Uluru, the government's official policy was to move them on while tour operators applied their own pressure to stop them from staying. By the mid-1960s, Uluru was well on its way to becoming just another tacky tourist spot surrounded by resorts and hotels. Luckily, events were about to give the government a severe attack of conscience. If you're not Australian, the chances you've heard of the Wave Hill walk-off are slim. A general strike by indigenous workers at a cattle station on August 23, 1966, it sounds like exactly the kind of historical footnote that you'd probably ignore. But make no mistake, this one strike directly led to Uluru being the place it is today. The story starts back in the 19th century, a mere two years after William Goss sat atop Uluru and decided to call it as Rock. Up in the Victoria River area, a guy called Nathaniel Buchanan had just been granted a huge swath of land. This was news to the Gurindi people who lived on that land, but Buchanan was determined, and soon Gurindi land was swarming with cattle, destroying the fragile ecosystem. But the Gurindi couldn't move elsewhere. Their culture emphasized a strong bond with their ancestral lands. So, unable to leave, they began working for Buchanan as cowboys. Over the next few decades, they put up with a horrendous amount of abuse. They received low wages. Their women were often assaulted. In 1965, the government tried to remedy this by increasing pay, but the new owners of Wave Hill Cattle Station they refused to pay the Gurindi an extra penny. By the following August, tensions had reached boiling point. Under community leader Vincent Lingiari, the Gurindi downed tools and walked off the job. But they didn't start picketing or acting like regular strikers. Instead, they set up a camp in the middle of their ancestral lands and issued a statement saying, We feel that morally the land is ours and should be returned to us. It was the spark that lit a thousand bushfires. Around Luru, the Anagu were inspired to try their own forms of protest. Guided by their own community leader, Paddy Aluru, they began a campaign to have their claims to the monolith recognized. By 1972, the campaign had gathered so much steam that the Labour Party was elected on a promise to look into land rights. In 1975, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam symbolically handed back part of Wave Hill to the Gurindi. The following year, the Aboriginal Lands Rights Northern Territory Act was passed, allowing Aboriginal groups to reclaim land if they could prove an ancestral right to it. 
Not that it was a sure bet that the Anagu would get Aluri back. The monolith lay inside the Erzrock National Park, meaning it was governed by different land laws. It took until 1983 for the Hawke government to amend the laws creating the national parks, specifically so the Anagu could make their claim. On October 26, 1985, the handback finally took place. Ayers Rock became a Luru yet again, and the land around it was returned to the Anagu. The only condition was that then they would lease the park back to the Australian government for 99 years so tourists could continue to visit and they would continue to allow people to climb a Luru. That last point, by the way, is pretty majorly controversial. Remember the tale of Lunkata, whose fiery death showed why you shouldn't climb a Luru? Well, the Anangu thought it was a sacred prohibition, and they don't want people climbing the rock. Getting everyone else around to their side was a different story. It took over 30 years for the Anangu to get their climbing ban through. Arguably, it only worked when tour operators saw which way the wind was blowing and started creating alternative activities to do around the rock. If you're feeling tempted to take the side of the climbers, don't be. While many treated Aluru with respect, many more urinated up their defecated and sacred pools, chucked drinks cans and diapers behind rocks, or stole stones from the site. There's a good reason they wanted climbing the monument banned, and that reason is that huge crowds of humans have a tendency to act like grade A douchebags. The final day for climbing Aluru was October 26, 2019, exactly 33 years after the handback. That evening, the last eight tourists on the rock stepped off as one, holding hands. When the sun rose on Aluru the next day, it was on a rock, untouched in ways it hadn't been since William Goss first scaled its sides. So that's the story of Aluru from prehistory to the present day. After an interregnum of almost a century, Australia's great landmark is returning to something like its natural state. But that doesn't mean that nothing has changed. From a remote spot unknown to those descended from Europeans to a place that tried to ban Aboriginal peoples, Aluru's recent history has been one of great tension. In the last few years, though, that tension seems to have melted away. As of 2019, Aluru is jointly managed by Anagu and non-Aboriginals, a place Australians of all backgrounds are cooperating to preserve for future generations. It may be 300 million years old, but Aluru today is as powerful and as iconic as at any other point in its history. When future generations visit Aluru hundreds of millennia from now, hopefully it is to see not a symbol of division, but one of endless cooperation. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. We put out a couple of videos every week on this channel, so by doing that, you will find out about those. And as always, thank you for watching.